Hey, Richard, how's it going? Good, good, just a little sleepy.
Yes, yes, there's a final project. Uh, we'll talk about it after the midterm. Um, I want you guys just to focus on the midterm first, but it'll be a, it'll be a group project, but we'll go over it next week. Yeah, it's it's very similar. It's very similar to 441. Yeah, you're going to do it in a group, and you're going to be doing um, you know a lot of individual research. But um, but yeah, the nature of the project is just naturally different because it's a different class. But yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've 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 taken classes when there's both been a final project and a final exam, and um, yeah, I I feel like when when though when those when those things happen, I think students kind of just split their attention between both. Um, but I'd rather you just you know put out one good product, and you know, um, and that should be it. And th and that's what a final thing for a class I think should be it should be you know a culmination of everything that you learned and. You can put everything that you, that you can into that project instead of trying to split your attention between two, two different things. Yeah. <laughs> well, every, every instructor has their own style of doing things, and so you know this is this is just my own personal personal take. But um, oh yeah, oh that's certain that's certainly true. <laughs> Especially in fall, fall semester is tough because it's, you know, we have Christmas right after the semester. And so, you know, if I had to grade both a final project and a final exam for one class, that would be, uh, uh, that would be not fun. I might not see my family. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's what, that's what it is.
All right, it's uh, one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Not too bad, good, good, so-so. Yeah, it's uh, busy times. Yeah, good afternoon to you too, yeah. yeah. All right, so today uh, today we're making a big change in this class. And so we're, we're transitioning from economics um, to ethics, right? And so we're about we're about two thirds done with the semester right now. Um, and so you know, for the last one third of the class, we're going to be talking about ethics, and it's 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 a really interesting um, split because um, you know when when I was in college, I, I actually never even took an, an economics class like this. Um, our class was just ethics, and so kind of packaging them both in the same class is is really interesting because in a lot of ways those two those two can be can be in conflict uh, a lot of times. Uh, but we'll talk about that more when we get into it today. Okay. All right. So the other the other big thing this week is we have our midterm exam on Thursday. Okay. So make sure you guys are studying for that. Um, I know homework five is is due tonight, and so uh, make sure you're you're working on that. Um, you know, problems like homework five and homework four, you know, those are great practice for the exam. So make sure that you understand them really well. Okay. Uh, and I do plan on posting the solutions for homework five tonight, uh, right after it's due, so that you can have that to study for the exam uh, as well. Okay. All right, so I got a couple questions about this, you know, um, kind of an email and, and before the class too, is that, uh, you know, after this midterm, um, you know, we have we have kind of two, two, we have two more assignments left in this class. And so we have a one more homework, uh, which is which is actually like a big, a big writing assignment. Um, and that's gonna be individual. And then we have, we have the final project after that, which is gonna be a group project, okay? We'll talk a lot more about the final project next week. Um, but, um, you know, what you can expect is that it's, it's going to be a group project and you're going to turn in a report at the end and you're going to do a presentation. Okay. And the final project is in lieu or it's, uh, it, it replaces the final exam. And so after this midterm this week, we have no more exams for this class. Um, it's just a bunch, it's just a lot of writing and a, and a big final project. Okay. Um, but I want to, I want to save that for next week because, um, you know, I, I want to at least introduce what ethics is today. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, everyone's kind of focusing on the exam right now. So I want to let you guys focus on the exam um, and then we can talk about the final project uh, beginning of next week. OK. All right. Um, so I think that's all my announcements. Are there are there any questions I can answer before we, uh, we get started? OK. All right. And so today um, today we're, we're starting something new. Right. So let's go ahead and, and get into it. Okay. So today we're going to be doing an introduction uh, to engineering ethics. All right. And so, you know, up to this point in the class, you know, we're in week 11 already. We've spent 10 weeks talking about economics, right? And so we've, we've talked a lot about how important it is for engineers to produce products that are profitable uh, and to minimize costs, you know, as, as much as possible throughout their, their engineering process. Okay. Because you know, um, just just by the nature of, of a lot of engineering projects, you know, they're undertaken um, for a company, right? Um, and so, you know, a lot of engineering projects just naturally require a lot of money because they have very expensive equipment, 
they have really expensive materials. And so, you know, it's not someone, it's not usually not something that you can do in your garage and, and make a business out of it, right? And so the economics of these, um, um, of these, of these big projects is, is really important because, you know, a company has to make money in order to stay afloat. And in order for them to make money, you know, they have their economics have to be, have to be solid. Okay. All right. Um, but, you know, there are exceptions to this, you know, and of course we talked about that um, before where there's a lot of engineering projects that are undertaken for the greater good. So like things like public works projects, um, you know, which um, service the roads and, and the tunnels and the waterways and things like that. But, but generally speaking, and, and I, and I, and, you know, I would say most of you will probably go on and work for a company that aims to be profitable as much as possible. Okay. All right. And so that's, that's of course really important. And, you know, that's why we spent a, a long time talking about that in this class. But another aspect to your engineering projects that you have to consider, you know, besides the technical details, of course, is the fact that, you know, your, your, your work and your products as an engineer are going to be used by people, right? Maybe, maybe not directly used by people, but it's, it's going to affect people's lives in, in some way or another, okay? Right, and, and, this is, and this is an aspect that you can't really ignore, right? And so, you know, be, I think being an engineer comes with a lot, of, a lot of benefits, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of us came into engineering, you know, um, with the promise of a stable paycheck, um, or, you know, we just have a lot of really, a lot of um, strong interest in the science and in the field, right? And so that's great. So that's all the good things. But, you know, whenever you make something, you know, that's gonna be used by people or it's gonna affect people, you know, there's, there's a moral and an ethical obligation that you have um, to minimize the negative consequences as much as possible, okay? Okay. And so that's, that's kind of what you also sign up for is, is being an engineer. Like, yes, you get to do cool stuff. Like, yes, you get to make, you know, good money, but, you know, you also sign up for the fact that, you know, you're going to, you know, not, you're going to have some, at least some professional moral responsibility. Right? And so in, in essence, you know, it sounds really easy, right? And so you just have to make sure that you don't, you know, hurt slash maim slash injure slash kill other people, right? Okay. Um, and so, you know, when you put it from that perspective, you know, it, it kind of makes it seem really simple, right? Uh, because this is something that we do um, every day, or, or at least I hope you, you do every day, okay? And so, you know, uh, you don't go out driving your car and be like, fuck that guy in, in, in particular and, you know, run over someone. Um, yesterday, I actually almost ran over someone. He was uh, skateboarding on campus when, you know, it was really dark and I almost didn't see him. So, um, you know, but we have, but, you know, as a human being, as someone with a, with a car, <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I had a moral and ethical responsibility to, to not run him over, right? And that's, that's kind of what we do. That's kind of what we sign up for as, as a human being as well, right? And so as an engineer, you know, that might seem obvious. You know, we, we just don't, just don't, just don't hurt people. That's, uh, that's an obvious thing. Um, 
But you know, what you'll see is that it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And so when you're talking about engineering projects, there's a lot of complications and a lot of competing factors that can, um, you know, that can, that can affect this decision. Maybe not explicitly, like, you know, I think most people are not going to go into work and say, you know, I'm going to develop a product that's going to hurt people, right? Um, but there's, but there's a lot of, um, you know, um, competing factors or confl conflicting interests where you might, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're, it makes you not as careful as you, uh, as you should be in certain situations, right? All right, great question. Yeah, so question in the chat. So what if we're tasked to design military uh, weapons? Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, and so that's that's definitely one um, one area that, um, you know, um, where where you are actually designing things actually, you know, um, hurt things. But, um, you know, that's that's a whole kind of other different story. And, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a lot more as we as we go on. But, um, but you know, that's that's something that you, um, you know, that's also kind of something that you you sign up for as well. And it's tough. And I think a lot of a lot of engineers they kind of go into that uh, and go into the defense field, you know, because because you know a lot of times the money is really good and a lot of times it's really stable. Um, but you know, I, I but you know a lot of people end up quitting that that uh, that line of work because because of that um, because of that sense. Uh, my aunt actually is is one of those people where like she works in defense. And you know, for a while, she worked for at a company that worked, that made weapons. And you know, she did it for a while because um, you know she the money was really good, and you know, and she had just she just you know, had some uh, had kids of her own. Um, but you know, it was it was it was tough on her as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, you know, uh, in discussing it with my aunt and, and kind of, you know, just knowing the field in general, I think a lot of people go into that, that field of making military weapons with the intent of, you know, this is going to be the, ultimately, like, yes, this is a weapon that can cause destruction, but you place trust in the, in the military, you place trust in the, in the soldiers and the generals that are using them um, to only use them to, you know, to protect, right? Um, to, you know, protect, ultimately protect, you know, um, the, the country or protect people, right? And so, um, you know, that's, that's one area of trust that you, can, that you can have. And of course, you know, how much trust that you have, it kind of varies person to person. And it's not something that's, um, you know, expected of, of everyone, but, you know, I think that's, that's how they justify it. All right, and so the way, and so you know, the way the class is going to be taught from here on out, you know, it, it's going to be very different. And so, you know, um, there's there's lots of different ways we can go about um, teaching ethics, um, and you know, and the humanities department I'm sure has their own way. Um, but I think you know, one thing that's really effective, uh, at least for me, when I was learning ethics, was to talk a lot talk a lot about case studies, um, because there's there's a lot of th there's actually a lot of things that have happened before in the past with um, with uh, engineering ethics that I think by talking about these stories and kind of picking them apart, um, I think they they make for a much more compelling case than just talking about ethical theory in general. And so you know you'll hear me talk about a lot of case studies you know in in the in the lectures. You know in some sense you can think of it as like story time. And so that's that's kind of how I see it. Um, and that's what your final project is going to be too. So for your final project it's going to be a case study report. You know where you look at you know particular. Um, you know, a particular engineering ethical, um, you know, um, case study and see uh, what it's like, okay. All right, and so uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, all right, and so with that, let's let's talk about our first story. And, and actually, I think a lot of you might know the story or at least, you know, in the last couple of years when I've talked about this, you know, a lot of people already know. Uh, but we're gonna tell the story of a, of a car, uh, a certain car called the Ford Pinto. All right, and so the Ford Pinto is a is a subcompact car developed by Ford Motors. Okay, and it was um, you know it was the, one of their big um, you know um, big cars in the nineteen seventies.
Okay. And so here's uh, here's my drawing of, of the Ford Pinto, which is going to be very poor, but you know. Right. So you get the idea. It was a it was a car. The Ford Death Trap. Yeah, that was the uh, that was his name. Yeah. All right. So this car, um, you know, it's 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 at this point, you know, it's, it's famous. You know, I, I can guarantee you that every single engineering ethics class, you know, tells this story. OK, uh, which is why, you know, I'm kind of getting it out of the way now. Right. So this car is famous, but it, it kind of got famous for all the wrong reasons. OK. And so I think the key the key event that kind of sealed its fate happened on August 10th, 1978. All right, and so on this on this day, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a Ford Pinto was uh, was driving on the freeway when it was it was struck from behind. Okay. And so normally, you know, uh, when you get rear-ended, yeah, it's, it's not pleasant, right? Like you get rear-ended, you know, maybe you're, you, you hurt your neck, you get some whiplash, right? Uh, but the way that the Pinto was designed was, was very dangerous. And so uh, what happened was that when this, uh, when this uh, Pinto was struck from behind, it actually ruptured the gas tank. And then it caused the, the entire, uh, basically it made the entire car explode in kind of a big fireball of, of, of flames. And so uh, it ended up killing three people inside the car. Okay. And so that's, and so that's not supposed to happen. And so when you get rear ended on the highway, like, yes, you know, it's unpleasant and yeah, you've got to get your insurance card out, but you know, you don't, you normally don't worry about your whole car exploding and, and dying. Right. Um, and so, you know, this was a huge, obviously a huge safety issue for, for the Ford Pinto. Right. And it wasn't the first time an incident occurred too. And so, um, you know, there were, there's been up to this point, there's been a lot of other incidents of Ford Pintos being struck from behind. Um, and that would cause, you know, fire because the gas tank would rupture. Okay. This was the, this, this was kind of the one that really, you know, broke the camel's back though, because this is the first one that resulted in, in deaths. Okay. Okay. Um, but, you know, Ford, the Ford Pinto has been having this issue, you know, for a long, long time. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So Brandon linked a, linked a good article so that, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to be skipping a lot of details, you know, just because there, we have a lot to cover today, but, you know, it's, it's a really, really interesting case that you can um, be, okay. Um, it's also, it's also a, a, a candidate for your final project too. So if you're interested in learning more about the Pinto, you know, you can choose it for your final project as well. Okay. All right, and so what was and so what was really devious about the the Ford Pinto um, was that Ford was actually aware of, of all these issues, right? So this is this didn't come as a surprise to Ford, okay? And so you know as a result of, of these three of these three deaths, uh, Ford was sued in a criminal lawsuit. Okay?
And so, you know, they were, they were fully aware of it, right? And so they, they knew that, you know, if you struck a Pinto from behind then, um, or, you know, do anything in that area, you know, you have, it runs the, a big risk of, of the whole thing just exploding, okay? And so that begs the question, you know, why, why would Ford, you know, if they were aware of this, uh, of this, um, of this default, uh, or this fault in the design, you know, why did they, why did they even put this car on the market, right? Um, and so the reason they put the, the, the car on the market was, um, you know, you know, we, we can, we can kind of spend a long time talking about nuance, but eventually it boils down to the fact that Ford wanted to make money off the Pinto. Okay. Because the Ford Pinto was was coming out in a time when you know competition for subcompact cars was really really intense, and so you know I think this is this is the time when Japanese cars were really starting to you know to kind of hit their stride in, in the American market, and Ford was trying to get into that space, um, and so Ford had actually spent quite a bit of time developing the Pinto, and you know it was getting to the point where it was it was you know they had to kind of put it out on the market in order to compete. Um, you know, but because of that, because they, they were driven by you know, economics at the end of the day, you know, they ended up putting out a product that was uh, that was not safe at all. OK. But the way that but the way that Ford justified it was that, um, you know, at the time when when the, the Pinto came out, it actually did meet um, um, safety standards uh, with respect to federal guidelines. OK. Which is why you know they were able to kind of to to legally put the car on the market in the first place, because if it was you know if it was um, you know obviously dangerous, then you know then um, you know law enforcement would actually put a stop to say that you can't you can't put this car in the market. You're obviously going to kill people. Okay, and so the Pinto actually did meet federal standards at the time, but it did not meet engineering standards at the time. Okay. And that's that's a big uh, that's an important distinction because um, you know um, you know just because something is is legal just because something is uh, is allowed under the law doesn't mean that it doesn't always mean that it's the right thing to do because the thing the thing with federal or the thing with laws especially federal laws that they they take a lot of time to to process they take a lot of time to actually come into effect right um, and so you know it's it's sometimes it's really slow for new government regulations or new or new uh, government laws to come in. To impose safety standards and so you know as you're working as an engineer you know you can't always rely on you know what are the federal requirements what are the federal you know safety standards for this because a lot of those are, are, are just not going to be up to date with you know with current with uh, with current technologies okay uh, and so what's going to be more reliable is that you use engineering standards that are developed by you know the professional engineering societies uh, sites like a ieee things like asme things like um you know um aiaa right and so those and so those standards are probably are going to be a lot more reliable just because they can be updated a lot faster, um, you know, when you're when you're developing a product. OK. All right. And so, you know, throughout the throughout the Pinto's design cycle, you know, the engineers knew the risks. Um, and so, you know, they, they had communicated this to management, you know, before, uh, but management um, pushed them to say that, you know, we we can't we can't develop this any longer. We have to push this to market because we have to start making money. OK.
Okay. And so the relationship that you have, you know, as an engineer with your management is, is also a really important aspect of engineering ethics. Um, and that's something that we're going to talk about in the class too. I think probably sometime, um, probably, probably in the week, um, right before Thanksgiving. That's what we're that's what we're going to do. Okay. All right. And so as an engine, and so as the so the four engineers kind of faced a big dilemma. And so they 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 faced the dilemma of balancing the safety of their customers with the economic productivity uh, profitability of, of the company. Okay, and it was, and you know, unfortunately, these two things were were put in conflict. Okay, and so I, I want to make it clear that you know, no one at Ford, you know, um, explicitly tried to hurt people, right? And so, you know, they weren't they weren't actively trying or maliciously trying, saying that you know we're putting out an unsafe product just so we can make a quick buck, right? It it wasn't like that at all, right? No one, um, you know, no one, no one's no one's like that. But you know what they, I think what they underestimated was that they underestimated the the risk of injury, right? Um, and so, you know, whenever you develop a product like this, you know, you always have to be thinking about, you know, what are the risks of injury? Because the risk is always going to be there, right? Even if you make like a really benign product, right? So even if you, you make like a coffee mug like this, right? Um, there's, there's risk associated with coffee mug, believe it or not, right? Because, because you know, you can, people can take this and they can smash it on someone's head, right? And so there's, there's always going to be risks, but you know, how, how you quantify those risks and, and what you deem as acceptable for your product, that's where some of this gray area of engineering ethics comes in. And that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of what we're gonna discuss over the next few weeks, okay? All right, uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, and so let's, uh, and so let's define um, engineering ethics, okay? Question. This is similar to the uh, Dalkin Shield. I'm actually not familiar with that story. Yeah. Oh, for yeah. Oh, I, I didn't hear about that. Oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I was I was I was about to say, you know, I think Ford's a much better company now, but yeah, maybe maybe they're um, maybe they they've still done some devious stuff in the past. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, and so you know, obviously, you know, the, the big moral of the story in the previous uh, in the previous story was that safety, public safety, is 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 really important, and that should be you know one of your number one priorities as uh, as an engineer. Okay. Uh, but there's but there's so many other aspects of engineering ethics that are out there too, and so some and so I'm just going to list out a, a a really quick list, and so you know uh, I'm going to try we're going to try to cover as much of these as possible in the class, but you know we we only have so much time left, and so you know we're not going to cover everything, but you know we will cover quite a bit of this. Okay. All right. And so some other factors include um, things like uh, bribery, um, things like fraud, okay. uh, environmental issues, right? Which is a which is a very um, hot topic issue right now with uh, with climate change. Okay. Um, honesty and research. That's a big one if you're if you're ever going to go into um, R and D. Um, computer privacy. All right, we'll be talking about that one a little bit. Um, and conflicts of interest. Okay. All right. So there, there's lots of different aspects of, of, um, of engineering ethics. And, you know, what I hope is that through all the case studies that we'll look at in the class and all the case studies that you look at from, uh, from your peers, you know, for their final projects too, you'll get kind of a good sense of, you know, of, of, all, the, all, of all these issues that people have dealt with in the past. Okay. 
All right, so let's let's give a definition of, of ethics in general, okay? All right, and so the definition of ethics is it's the study of the characteristics of morals. Okay. Um, it's the study of the characteristics of morals and the moral choices that are made by, in, by individuals and, and people. Okay. All right, so that's the definition of ethics in general, right? And so engineering ethics is, you know, obviously just a subset of it, okay? And so engineering ethics uh, refer to the rules and standards governing the conduct of engineers um, in their roles as professionals. Okay. And so, um, you know, engineers, just like any profession, you know, have, have kind of rules and standards um, on which they, um, you know, they should conduct their work. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're going to, to talk about. Okay. All right. And, and, you know, probably, probably you guys have um, already kind of understand this based on what we've talked about today, but ethics is, is very unlike, um, you know, probably any other engineering class that you've taken. And so, um, it's probably going to be this is probably going to be a lot closer to what you've taken in, in maybe your GEs or humanities class okay and so it's I, I consider it like a very much like an art like an art type subject um, and so there's no formulas there's no tables um, there's no um, you know definitive answers right and so there's you know there's there's not going to be a, a right answer to things okay um, and with the short amount of time that we have left you know it's going to be really impossible to cover all the complex interests, intricacies and, and nuance, um, you know, that there is to engineering ethics, okay? And so my goal, therefore, is, is not to, you know, is not to give this a very comprehensive treatment. Um, and so what my goal for, for this part of the class is to, is to mostly build an awareness, right? Is to, is to make you aware that, you know, when you, when you make decisions as an engineer, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what product to pursue or, or how you're gonna develop a, a certain type of technology, like, yes, there is economic ramifications for it, right? And so we've we spent a lot of time talking about that in this class already. Uh, but there's also moral ramifications. There's also ethical ramifications as well, right? Especially thinking about, you know, how is your product going to be used by people? How is it going to affect the environment, right? Um, is this going to collect data on people? You know, is this going to affect people's privacy? You know, are there any competing interests for this, uh, uh, for this project too, right? And so there's, you know, I want you to, I want to make you aware of all these things. So th these are things that, you know, that you don't learn about in, in your other classes. Um, and so, you know, I want you to think about, I want you to kind of be aware of, of all these kind of, um, you know, um, almost, almost like unspoken things that, that go on with engineering projects, just so that, you know, when you do come across these kinds of situations, and I guarantee you that you will come across some situations like this in your professional life, that you'll have something that you'll, you, you'll, you'll somewhat be prepared for, okay? 
Um, in a sense, you know, nothing, nothing will fully prepare you for, you know, what other, what, whatever kind of ethical dilemma that you might face in your professional life, right? I can tell you that, you know, in the short time that I've had this job, you know, there's, there's been a lot of situations that I've been in that, you know, no one told me that I was, I was going to deal with explicitly, right? It just, it just happened and you kind of have to figure out how to deal with it. But I think by, um, you know, by just the general training that I had in, in just ethics and research and, you know, in the trainings that I've gotten as, as an instructor, you know, I was able to come up with a solution. And so, you know, maybe I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the perfect solution at the time, but I at least could, you know, um, could think about that, you know, this, yes, this is an issue and I can come up with a, you know, a solution that, um, you know, at least, at least I'm satisfied with in terms of my personal morals and my professional morals as well. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be exposed to a lot of situations in this part of the class. We're going to be talking about a lot of, you know, um, um, ethical dilemmas, but, you know, hopefully through all that, um, you know, you'll gain, you'll gain an awareness of these and, and be more, and be more prepared when you get to the, when you get to your professional life, um, uh, to know what to do in these kinds of situations. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on, uh, on this so far? Okay. All right. And so, you know, one thing, one thing I, I want to, um, you know, make you aware of too, is that, um, you know, when, when you make decisions as an engineer, you don't always have perfect information, okay? And actually this, this is true for your life too, right? And so whenever you make a big decision on anything, um, you know, you don't have all the information available to you, right? And so, you know, as an engineer, you know, you can never be 100% certain that their work will end up with a certain outcome, right? You just, you just, you just never really know for sure. Okay. Um, and so, you know, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of work that you do, there's, there's always going to be risks. Okay. okay. And so that's, that's something important to understand. So that you'll, you're never, no matter how careful you are, you're never going to eliminate risks. Okay. It, there's always going to be there. But I, I don't want you to ad adopt the mindset that you know, risk is always going to be there, and so you know we just should we shouldn't we just shouldn't care about it, okay? And so it's it's not about caring about risk versus not caring about risks, okay? That's that's not the mindset to that's not the mindset to have, right? And so the mindset to to have with regards to risk is that you know you should try to manage and minimize the risks um, as much as much as you can. Right? Okay. And so, you know, that's, you know, that's what you, that's what you want to do. Okay. And so you're going to, and so, you know, you have to do things like you have to do adequate amount of testing. You have to do, you know, um, ethical reporting, right? So you have to always make sure that you're truthful when you're reporting, because these are things that that's ultimately going to manage and, and minimize the risk as possible. Okay. 
<laughs> right. So I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to be paranoid about everything. I mean, be, be aware that, that, you know, of all, of all the, uh, of all the, of all the things that can happen, right. That's important to do. And so don't, don't kind of close your eyes to, to those things, but, you know, but also kind of be realistic about these, um, these things too. Right. And so think about what's, what's reasonable to, um, to minimize, right. What's, what's an absolute thing that you cannot have happen. Right. And then make sure you, you do the adequate test in order to make sure that it doesn't happen. All right, and so let's let's talk a bit more specifics, right? And so that's kind of you know let's talk about ethics and kind of morals in, in general, okay? But let's talk about you know what are some actual codes of ethics that you can follow to help guide your to guide your action, okay? All right, question. So as an R and D, what are the chances of you getting fired due to you not being able to find significant um, fines during a research process? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I, and I think it's it's a question that a lot of researchers struggle with a lot. Um, you know, because a lot of a lot of companies and, and individuals too, you know, and and I'd say you know a lot of a lot of faculty too uh, with their own research, everyone's pressured to find like the new big biggest and best thing, right? That's what kind of gets you the big bucks. That's what gets you famous and, and stuff like that. But um, but you know, there's a lot of research that's that has to be done out there. That's really important work that you know is is probably not going to be flashy or sexy, right? And so doing research to show that something doesn't work. Um, you know, maybe maybe you thought of something and maybe you tried it out and maybe it didn't work out the way that you, you thought. That's an important, in my opinion, that's an important research contribution because that tells other people, hey, don't try this thing. It, it doesn't work, <laughs> you know, but but no one wants to. But unfortunately, you know, no one wants to see that. And so, you know, no one wants to um, say that, you know, I, I thought of this thing, but it didn't work out the way that I thought, um, which is really sad, I think, you know, because I think there it kind of it kind of. Um, I, I don't want to say poison, but it, it, may, it makes the uh, it makes the research field it makes you question about you know whenever you read like a, a significant result in like a in like a you know in a research paper, you know how how true is this really right? Um, because some people because people are going to um, you know not 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 fake their data of course you know that would be that would be an egregious egregious sin but you know people people definitely try to make their data look better. They're always going to make their data look better than it actually is, right? And that's something you always have to be aware of when you're when you're reading research papers. Um, and that and that's not to say that everyone does it, but you know, it's but the the possibility is there, and it's and it's really unfortunate. So, yeah, it's uh, kind of kind of the uh, kind of the unfortunate state of R and D at, at at this time. But whether you whether or not you get fired for it, it depends on the culture of the company. Honestly, you know, and I would hope that you would never be put into a position where, you know, you feel like you have to make like a significant breakthrough um, to, you know, to keep your job just to have job security. But, you know, it, it kind of depends on the culture of, of the place that you're working at. Yeah, but I, I would hope that that's not the case. Yeah. All right. That was a long monologue. I didn't expect a monologue for that long about that. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about you know what are some uh, some codes of ethics that you have as an engineer um, that can help guide your um, that, to help guide your um, decision making. Okay, because we've already because we've already seen with the Fort Pinto that you know federal regulations uh, are a good place to start. You know, but they don't but they don't cover every single situation. Okay, All right, and so as, as engineers, we actually have a fantastic resource available to us to kind of help guide our behavior, and that's all of our professional societies. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are part of these societies already. And so these are societies like IEEE, things like ASME, things like AIAA, right? Um, and so, you know, those are the kind of the big ones that pop off the top of my head, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of other ones as well. Okay. And then I, and the cool thing about these societies is that they're managed and they're run by people in your field. And so they're, they're experts just like you. Okay. And so these professional societies, they make their own code of ethics, uh, which, you know, which 
um, expresses the way that, you know, in their opinion, that an ethical engineer should, uh, should act, okay? Right. And so these and so these codes actually are a great first stop shop. And so you know if you're if you're wondering about you know where where you can where you can look to learn how to be an ethical engineer, start with the code of ethics for the society that you're that you're part of. Okay. Okay. All right. And so, you know, every 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 professional society has one. And so, you just you just kind of have to look it up. And actually, if you've been to their websites, you know, it might have been something that you might have scrolled past and and, and maybe not even realized. But it's uh, but it's there, and it's uh, um, and they're and they're they're all great. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but you know, the key word for this is framework. Okay. And so they're not they're they're not going to tell you exactly what you need to do, right? Because um, the, just the nature of ethical dilemmas is that they're very complex and very, uh, you know, there's lots of different situations. Okay, and so don't don't think of these codes as like a magic conch, right? And so uh, I don't know if you've seen the episode of SpongeBob where he pulls on the magic conch and it tells him what to do, right? These frameworks are not going to be like that, right? And so they're going to give you kind of guidelines and, and and a framework, but it's up to you to kind of interpret these and apply them to whatever situation that you're um, that you have. Oh yeah, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are, are, are familiar with these guidelines and standards already, <laughs> especially if you're, uh, you know, if you're in senior design. I think there, I think there's been a big push to make it part of your, uh, um, make it part of your curriculum as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. All right. Uh, and so, you know, as, as part of the, you know, as part of, of, as part of this unit, and, you know, when you do your writing assignments, you know, I'm going to refer you to these professional codes of ethics, and I want you to incorporate them in your, in your writing, okay? Um, and so, um, I'm going to put, I'm going to put links for them on the Canvas site. And so, I, I haven't done that yet, just because I have, I've, I've kind of forgotten, uh, but I'm going to put links to them just so that you can access them, okay? Another useful, another useful um, use for these codes of ethics is that they can support you um, in making your ethical decisions, okay? Okay, and so what I mean by that is that you know if you're if you're put into a position you know very similar to the Ford engineers where you know you you have you have a product that you think is unsafe but you know maybe management or maybe the owner or the CEO wants you to push it out anyway you can use these code of ethics to say that hey you know I, I don't feel comfortable with this and professionally I'm not I I'm I'm obligated to stop this production because of my code of ethics. Okay. Um, and so that's and so that's a really nice uh, benefit to engineering societies, right? Um, and so they kind of act as as you know people in your in your corner, right? And so if if management or someone is pressuring you to do something, you have the entire professional society behind you to say that you know I don't think this is safe, you know because of these because of these codes of ethics, and the society will will back you up, and so they'll you know they'll act they actually have they hire people to go and and represent you and and to fight on your behalf. You know, to not have you do something that you don't feel professionally uncomfortable to do. Okay. And so I think a lot of people don't realize this. And so I, I think a lot of people, you know, when they go get a job, they think they're at the mercy of their management or the owners of the company, right? And so whatever they say that you have to do. But you also, but you have you have an entire society of of, of professionals that that are, you know, that are in your field that will back you up on, on decisions like these. And so don't, don't be afraid to utilize that as, as a resource. Okay. Um, especially, especially when you're driven to do something, you know, that you feel comfortable with. Okay. All right. 
And so there's there's lots of codes of ethics out there. And so, um, you know, because there's a lot of engineering societies, uh, but, you know, we're going to talk, we're going to focus mostly on two that I think are, that I think are really good. Okay. And so the first one is IEEE. Okay. And so the IEEE standards are, are really nice. And so, um, you know, in, in terms of length, they're, they're a lot shorter to understand. Okay. Um, but because they're they're shorter and easier to understand, they're they're a little bit more general, and and more up for um, up for for general interpretation. Okay. Okay. Right, and then the other the other big one that I'll, I'll have you reference in your um, in your in your assignments is the NSPE standards. Okay. Okay. And so NSPE stands for the National Society of Professional Engineers. Okay. And so NSPE, when you compare it to IEEE, they're a lot longer and a lot more detailed. And so naturally, it's, it's going to take longer to get through, um, but you know it's because but that detail helps a lot because that that you know it, it leaves a lot less up to interpretation and kind of gives you more uh, more clear guidelines on certain things. Okay. Okay. All right, and so you know these are these are great resources, and so you know definitely make use of them as you um, you know as you go about um, you know doing your professional work. Okay? And so in this class, you know you're you're going to be reading them. You know we're going to be you know using them in our assignments, but don't forget about them after the class, okay? Because they're um, you know they're great, always good to have on hand. And actually, a lot of workplaces actually display the co these codes of ethics in their workplace as well. And so they might have a poster of it somewhere or somewhere there. Um, and so, you know, don't, don't ignore it. And so, you know, make sure it's, it's always kind of handy for you, um, you know, just to help guide your, to guide, help guide your decision making. Okay. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right, and so that's the professional codes. And so the professional codes is, is a great resource, you know, to help, to help guide your ethical decision making, okay? Some other, some other um, theories that can help you um, make ethical decisions are more general um, ethical and moral theories. Okay. And so these, and so these would be concepts that you would probably learn more in, in, a, in a general ethics class, right? And so you would take you take ethics in, uh, um, from a different department here, from one of the humanities department. These are some of the uh, probably these are some of the theories that you can that you'll learn. Okay. And so even though these these theories are really just general and they're uh, just just by nature what they are, you know they're they're good to think about. Okay. Um, and some of these actually conflict with each other, which I think is is the really interesting thing. Um, but it's just kind of more food for thought and kind of more um, more kind of exposure for you to, to get practice thinking, you know, from an ethical point of view. Okay. Okay. Right. And so, you know, I, I want to make that distinction where, you know, these are all ethical theories, and ethical frameworks. And so they're not, they're not truths. Okay.
Okay. Um, but they're, but they can be helpful because, you know, if you're, if you think of things like uh, in terms of, you know, we'll talk about utilitarianism, we'll talk about duty rights, ethics rights, um, or, uh, um, you know, those, um, those kind of things, right? So they can, they can help, but they're not going to tell you, you know, they, they shouldn't be the only thing that factors into your decision. That's, that's my, that's my main thing. Okay. All right. And so the, the first one we'll talk about is uh, utilitarianism. And so the idea with utilitarianism is that they, this is a theory that strives to maximize the well-being of society as a whole. Um, and they would, and so um, utilitarianism seeks to maximize this rather than maximize the well being of an individual. Okay. All right, and so you know, if if it's uh, what utilitarianism says is that you know, if we can take, if we can do something, if we can, if we can undertake a project that will provide a, a greater good for society as a whole at the sacrifice of you know maybe a few people, then that's then that's a an ethic that would be an ethical thing to do. Okay. All right, and so let's 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 think let's uh, just go over a quick example of this in action. So one one good example of utilitarianism is the construction of dams. Okay, and so dams are are great are generally great for uh, for community. Okay. And so they provide things like flood control, they provide, you know, um, clean drinking water, a lot of times they provide power as well, okay. Okay. Right. So I think generally speaking that those are all, those are all things that are good for, for society. Okay. Um, but, you know, the, the construction of the dam um, can cost the, um, in, can cost the lives of the individuals that live near it. Okay. And so a lot of times because of dam construction and because of local flooding that may occur during construction, uh, a lot of the individuals that live near the dam either have to, have to relocate to, to different places. Okay. Okay, and so what we have here is that you know potentially a, a small amount of people, a small amount of individuals that live near the dam, they have to suffer some negative consequences 
in order for the dam to you know, produce a, a, a public good. Okay, and so with utilitarianism, you know, they they said uh, people uh, people say that this is a sacrifice that's worth making, right? Because this dam is going to provide so much good, you know, for uh, for so many people that you know um, if we if we inconvenience the lives of a few of a, of only a few people, you know, that's something that's worth um, that's worth taking. Okay. Um, and so, you know, one, one, one thing that this makes you think of is, you know, benefit cost analysis, right? And so, you know, the benefits, um, you know, the benefits to society outweigh the costs that may occur to, you know, the individuals that are around, you, okay? And so, you know, um, obviously, you know, this is not, this is not a perfect theory, right? Okay. And so even, and so if you play it by just the numbers, then like, yes, you know, it's, it's something that's good for a lot of people is, is fine if it only hurts, you know, a few certain amount of other people, right? And so in terms of numbers, so people who love numbers, they love utilitarianism, right? Because, you know, it, it's just, you, you, you just, it seems like you, the benefit cost ratio is, is ginormous, right? And so that's, that's kind of what it makes it seem like. Um, but, you know, that's not really fair to the people that, that have to pay the price, right? Um, and so if you think about it, you know, what if, what if, um, you know, what if a situation occurs where you and your community have to pay the price for something that's going to be for the greater good, right? Uh, where, you know, you may not have had any say in it, maybe you didn't agree to it at all. Okay. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance to this. And so it's, there's, it's a lot more than just saying that, you know, this is, this is going to benefit a lot of people. So we should do it. Okay. Because, you know, the, the people that get hurt by it, you know, you have to really think about them uh, as well. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so let's uh, and so let's go to the other side of the spectrum. So let's talk about duty ethics and rights ethics. Okay. Right, and so both of these, um, both of these ethical theories are, are similar in that their their kind of their main point is that we should strive to protect the individual rights of um, uh, of of other people. Okay. Okay. Right, and so you know a lot of the uh, you know, a lot of our um, you know core core principles in, um, in in the United States kind of are built off duty, um, duty ethics and rights ethics, rights 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 ethics. Okay, and so you know um, you probably heard this line before that you know each and every individual has the right to life, liberty, and pro and property, right? And it's all of our collective responsibilities to protect these. Okay. Okay. Right, and so this this is almost in, in direct opposition with utilitarianism, right? And so utilitarianism said that you know we can um, you know we can we can sacrifice the um, the um, you know the rights of, of some people you know to to make for the greater good. But you know what under duty rights and ethic and rights ethics we said that you know this is not this is not um, you know something that's that's good, right? Because every everyone deserves a, a chance to be happy, right? and so anything that infringes on those rights. 
is uh, is not is not an ethical decision to make. Okay. Okay. Um, and so you know this is and so this is really difficult at times, right? Because you know I, I think especially nowadays when you know um, everyone has social media and, and you know there's um, you know um, anything that anyone can say can can infringe on someone's rights, right? Um, and you know and um, you know, so this is this is a very complicated one to to do. Okay, and so just like utilitarianism, you know, this is by itself is not a perfect theory. Okay? Um, and it's especially difficult in, in such a diverse country like the United States, okay? Because uh, every, uh, you know, every, everyone has, there's, there's such a diverse um, range of people here in the United States and, you know, there's lots of different competing rights and competing uh, interests, okay? All right. Any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. Um, and so uh, let's talk about virtue ethics. Okay. So virtue ethics is, is an interesting um, you know, um, school of thought, okay? And so um, the idea with virtuous with virtue ethics is confirm is you know talking about um, you know not necessarily you know um, individuals or public good or things like that. Virtue ethics talks a lot about um, you know, virtuous, what we consider to be virtuous characteristics, okay? Okay, and so things like uh, responsibility, things like honesty, things like competence, loyalty, respect, right? So these are all virtues that we consider to be, you know, good. Okay. Okay. And so when you're making your decisions, you know, you should, you should think about, you know, is this, is this a responsible decision to make? Is this, is this an honest thing for me to say? You know, am I showing competence by, by making this decision? Am I showing loyalty? Am I showing respect? Right. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a very different way of thinking of, of ethical, um, of ethics, you know, in terms of these, um, you know, characteristics that we, that we generally like. Okay. Um, and you know a lot. And what's interesting about this is that you know these are often characteristics that we give to people, right? And so we say that's a responsible person, that's an honest person, right? And so it, it really turns this into kind of a more personal kind of um, thing. Okay. On the flip side, you know, um, virtue ethics also deals with characteristics that we deem are 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 generally bad. Okay. And so they were they're kind of the opposite of a lot of the uh, a lot of the adjectives that I have up there. So things like. Um, dishonesty, disloyalty, irresponsibility, disrespect, right? Okay. And so if you can characterize your, if you characterize your decision as, as one of these characteristics, then that goes against uh, virtue ethics as well. Okay. All right. And so, you know, this is, this is difficult to apply in, in an engineering context, because, you know, like I said, these are typically characteristics that we apply to people. Okay. Um, 
and so you know applying this in terms of you know um of what of, of what pump that you should buy right it's not that you're saying that this pump is going to be responsible it's going to be an honest loyal hardworking, you know pump right and so you know that's not something that we give to engineering machines um but you know you can you can still characterize certain actions as um as having virtuous characteristics okay Okay. All right. So again, you know, very different ethical theory, and you know, by itself is is not you know it's not complete, but just something else that you can think about. Okay. All right. And so you know, to wrap up today, you know, I have, I have one more story that I I want to that I want to give that I think gives a good um, I think comparison between you know where we have been and kind of where we're going. Okay. And so in in 1984, um, there was a big disaster in uh, in India actually. So in the city of Bhopal. India, okay? There was a chemical plant in the area, okay? Um, oh, question. So would companies combine these ethics as part of their mission statements? A lot of them do, yeah. And so a lot of them do, um, you know, incorporate aspects of these um, of these ethics into their mission statements to, you know, to try to guide just, you know, broader company policy. Yeah, definitely, okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, in, in India, you know, the, the kind of the unfortunate thing that happened was that a pressure relief valve at this at this chemical plant um, it broke and so it uh, it kind of it started spewing toxic chemicals into into the area um, and unfortunately you know it this this chemical plant was in an area that was very densely populated and so you know one that chem, once that chemical got out it was disastrous and so it killed about um, two thousand people you know which is you know which is a which is a, a gigantic number. And even beyond that, thousands and thousands more were either injured or, or even permanently disabled as a result of the uh, as a result of the spill. Okay, and so upon investigation later on, um, you know, the uh, officials found out that the cause of the valve breaking was due to a long series of negligent behavior. Okay, and so just the the maintenance and the care for the plant was just was just not up to uh, was just not up to standards. Okay. And so pipes were misconnected, uh, essential safety systems were turned off or broken, um, you know, and so it was, you know, it was not some, it was not a freak accident. This was, this was something that occurred due to, you know, a lot of negligence in the area. Okay. Um, but before this, you know, the chemical plant was actually producing a huge economic benefit to, to the area. Right. And so it was bringing in tons of revenue. You know, it was a lot of the local, a large percentage of the locals worked at the plant. Right. And so you know, it, economically, it was a huge win for the uh, for the area. But, you know, but this economic benefit has to be balanced with, you know, the risks and the safeties and all the precautions have to be have to be taken, you know, in order to ensure that no one is, is hurt. OK. And so I think, you know, what happened was that the officials in the area kind of, um, you know, kind of got a little bit greedy and they said that, you know, we're making a ton of money. We can be a little bit more relaxed in our safety measures. Right. Um, but, you know, obviously the, the results are, are very deadly. OK, and so, you know, we and so at this point, you know, we kind of sit at an interesting crossroads in the class where, you know, we say that, you know, economics, yes, really important for engineering. But, you know, you have to balance that with your with your ethical decisions as well. And unfortunately, you know, these two these two aspects in your in your engineering decision making are going to come in con and con come in conflict with each other and how you kind of manage that and kind of, you know, steer steer around those two issues is is going to be challenging and it's going to be a big it's going to be a big challenge for you as professional engineers okay and so I'll, I'll say i'll say one more thing you know before we sign off for today that you know and so you know i'm i'm i i know i know what this class is going to be um like right and so you know probably out of all the classes that you take this is probably going to be the one that's going to be the most forgettable and like i and i know that right and so it's it's not a technical class right it doesn't teach you you know any cool equations or anything like that and so you know, I, I know that this this class is just going to be a footnote in your academic journey. But you know, what I hope is that you know you still take away something from this class that you still you know you still you know are aware of of, of all the of all the ethical dilemmas that can occur as an engineer, and that when you do face something like this in, in real life, that you're that you're prepared for. It, okay. And so I'm not I'm not trying I'm not going to try to make this class you know um, 
you know, the coolest thing in the world, because, you know, a lot of the topics that we'll talk about are, are serious. And, you know, I think they, they deserve kind of a serious um, discussion. But, you know, I do hope that you take something away and, you know, that it's, uh, you know, that it, that it serves you well in your professional career. Okay. All right. And so that's, uh, and so that's, that's all we got time for today. And so next time we see each other on Thursday is the midterm. And so remember, you don't, you don't have to come onto the call on, on Thursday. And so you can just take the midterm on Canvas. Uh, but if you want to come onto the call and ask questions, that's fine too. Okay. All right. So best of luck studying for the exam, everyone. Um, so the homework solutions will be posted tonight. Um, and so um, make sure you're looking out for that if you want to use that to study. Okay. And if you have any other questions, then I have office hours today. I have office hours tomorrow, uh, but if those don't work, you can um, you can let me know. We can make an appointment. Okay. All right. So thanks everybody. Um, you know, hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and I will see you on Thursday.